Hey everyone, my name is Dr. Dolores Tarver. I'm a licensed psychologist here in Georgia, coming to you with your next mental health moment. And today we will be discussing, you don't have any real problems, which is about youth and suicide. So as many of you know, September is Suicide Awareness and Prevention Month. And we take time during this month to be able to talk to people about suicide, to demystify suicide, to provide education and resources, and ideally to help in the prevention of people getting to a point where they consider suicide as an option. We know there's still a, a huge stigma around mental health in our communities, and we know that suicide is one of those words that makes people very uncomfortable. And for people who have unfortunately lost someone to suicide, it can bring up a lot of pain and trauma, and people just tend to not want to talk about it and so we want during this month to focus on some of the areas that may be helpful for you to share with your families uh, to be able to even help yourself because we are going through a very difficult time with this coronavirus and i know some of you may be thinking i'd never consider suicide but i will tell you you get to a deep dark place of despair enough in that hole where you feel like you can't see your way out and you really don't know what you might experience. So I think it's important to not be dismissive of what people go through and understand that all of us are just a step away if we had the right trigger, that right pain, the right loss, the right hurt, um, the right hopelessness, then we definitely could be in a place we could not foresee ourselves being in now. So this month I'm going to focus on children, women, men and our older adult population in uh, the videos. And, and guys, if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to me. I uh, wanna be able to provide as much resources as I can for people, because I want you guys to be around, we need you. Uh, so let's talk about um, kids and suicide. And I know in a previous video, I had talked a little bit about suicide and I covered some of these statistics, but I want to just kind of go over them. Um, suicide is still the second leading cause of death for our young people and young adults ages 10 to 24. And I want you to really let that sink in because these are folks that are in the prime of their youth. And we oftentimes think, which is where that title came from, like what could you be going through at that young age? It is a representation of the struggles um, that our young people are going through, whether they're academic, in peer relationships, and family relationships. Like our young people are really struggling, trying to cope and manage all of the things that they are responsible for in their emotional well-being, and some of them with physical and um, mental health concerns that they're dealing with on top of that. So I, I wanna make sure that I highlight that just because a person is under the age of 25, does that mean that they are not going through very difficult things, even if you think they may not be? Uh, so I wanna get us in the habit of, of um, making sure that we're paying attention to our young people when they're trying to speak to us about their struggles. Uh, for our black children um, between um, ages five to 11, in the years of 1993 to 2013, the rate of suicide for them uh, doubled, right? Doubled which means that more and more of our young people are struggling with things and getting to the place of contemplating suicide. Um, suicide by hanging almost tripled in black boys um, during this time frame. And, and I want you to really think about that, uh, but where a, a young male, a young black male would get to the point that he would be in such pain and agony uh, that he would hang himself to relieve that that hurt, that that um, excruciating pain that he's going through. And I also want you all to be aware that many high school students do consider death. Now they may not necessarily all get to the point of considering uh, con uh, completing suicide, but they may get to that place of thinking about, hey, would things be better if I weren't here? So I just want that to settle in for people because we're really dealing with an area that we can no longer choose um, or afford to, for that matter, um, to ignore. We've got some work to do with our young people. They need us. 
they need our help they need our support and resources and so hopefully through this video we'll be able to give you some skills to better talk to people about what they need um, so let's talk about some risk factors all right so what are the things that potentially get our young people to this place uh, for kids 5 to 11, that is going to be in general relationship issues with family. That is going to be your biggest stress factor for our kiddos. Um, they may be also dealing with the effects of ADHD or other challenges that they feel like are causing them problems in the home. Um, they're labeled as the bad one or the, the problem child or like, I'm so tired of having to come and deal with you with something or it's always, right, so they begin to take on that persona of feeling like they're just constantly messing up or that the family has to attend to them more frequently um, or that they're different possibly than their siblings because uh, we sometimes uh, in intention, unintentionally compare our children in front of them uh, and so they pick up on those things of okay well I'm not like big brother I'm not like little sister so what does that mean does that mean that I'm not worthy I'm not worth it and and the family would be better off without me um, for our teens they're dealing with depression a lot of times breakups can be a huge uh, trigger for them and frequently parents will say they were doing well they were doing well academically at scholarships they uh, won sports teams but they don't put enough weight into how much a relationship means to a teenager a relationship with a, um, a boyfriend a girlfriend um, and even sometimes relationships with peers and wanting that acceptance and wanting to feel valued. Uh, we have kids that are struggling, struggling with gambling, um, not gambling, gaming um, and, and porn, internet addictions. And then parents come in and set these boundaries and these limits once they realize this. Your, uh, children, you find they're posting uh, inappropriate uh, sexually explicit videos online and so you shutting down phones and tablets and uh, restricting them and so they they don't even know how to function without having access to that community that was giving them some kind of praise whether it was people they were online with or uh, people that liked their photos or, or that, that were giving them what they considered to be positive feedback when they sent these things and so shutting that off can send kids into a, this hopelessness and despair because they just feel cut off from everyone and everything and they don't have what they feel like is a validation uh, for them by, by people that they perceive matter um, they could be people that are experiencing our kiddos could be experiencing violence they could be violence in the home um, they may have seen violence in other places that can be a trigger for them um, causing nightmares or, or uh, night terrors, wetting the bed, things that they don't want to continue to see. They can't turn off those images in their mind. And so they're just trying to quiet the storm, if you will. Uh, and they consider suicide as a way to potentially do that. We know that our kids that get bullied, they are at high risk. Um, they are struggling with people making them feel inadequate and inferior and unworthy. Um, and they are not wanting to go to school, right? They are, they are not wanting to be around people because they're constantly being taunted or made fun of. And um, I know that for us parents, we might have been bullies growing up or may have experienced someone saying some mean things about that. And that can really hurt you at that age as you're just trying to come into your own identity development. Uh, access to firearms is a, a risk factor. So if there are firearms in the home and you have kids around, kids are curious um, and they may just be exploring. We've seen a lot of, unfortunately, um, sibling deaths related to kids playing with guns and it go off. Uh, then you have that devastation that the family uh, is dealing with. And then how am I to react to that uh, as the person who shot my sibling? Um, I may consider suicide as a result of that, or I may um, inadvertently um, kill myself as I'm trying to play with a gun. Um, we have, we know that there, uh, we have folks online who are prompting our kids to uh, complete suicidal things. There's websites kids can go to to figure out how to complete suicide and strategies and. Um, so there's these roadmaps and then you'll have friends that'll pressure them like, oh yeah, just do it, just do it. Um, and, and, and kids kind of cave into that. Uh, being impulsive would be one of those reasons why 
Um, so, so someone gives me this idea and I'm like, okay, well, let me see. Um, that rejection, uh, not being accepted into a peer group. So some of our kids who uh, may be a little bit, we, we sometimes say quirky, uh, but, but haven't connected with people who are similar to them or they haven't been able to feel comfortable enough around people to form their, their group. And so they are feeling very isolated and alone. And that definitely can be a trigger for our kids. Feeling like a burden to a family. If families are going through a lot of financial stress right now, we know that folks are underemployed, unemployed, and resources are harder and harder to come by. And so as you have children, children begin to start picking up on that there's a lack of resources and wonder like, hey, would you guys be better off if you had one less person? You had to worry about feeding, clothing, um, making sure they had what they needed for housing. And so kids will often take on the responsibility of taking care of the family, um, sometimes feeling like they need to be in that role. Um, for our kids that are just pessimistic, right? we know some kids just kind of have that half empty glass mentality. And so it is more likely that they'll be negative and, and cynical and more likely to feel kind of hopeless uh, at times. And so that uh, way of thinking often can be a trigger to getting to that point of hopelessness and desperation that is frequently associated with suicide. And, and depression is one of the major factors that our kids are dealing with that's going to be a trigger. Um, that and, and any kind of um, behavioral academic problems that they're constantly getting in trouble uh, for, those are also going to be triggers and, and um, substance use also being a trigger there. So parents often ask me, what are the warning signs? And parents, I don't want you guys to get to a point where uh, you are obsessed about just kind of watching your children and they do things that are just normal and typical uh, in for their developmental age group. Uh, that you begin to start putting things on them because that's what we don't want. I don't want you to project onto your kids that they may be suicidal when they are in fact not, but they may be going through uh, different kind of moody transitions as, as kids do um, and trying to get a hold of their emotions because their emotions are really big as they're learning how to regulate. And so you will see some of these things, just typical behaviors. But if you see a more persistent, consistent pattern and it's starting to affect them in multiple areas, that's when I say we need to be um, a little bit more concerned. So for our little kiddos, the red flags are sometimes a little more subtle. And so they may say something like, no one cares, you don't care about me. They wouldn't necessarily say, I wanna die. Um, but phrases that are similar to that, no one cares, you don't care about me. You wouldn't miss me if I died. Uh, you'd be better off if I was gone. I won't bother you anymore when I'm, I, I'm gone. Um, and then we may hear uh, kids say, you wish I was dead, um, not necessarily that I wish I was dead, though your teenagers might end up saying something like that. Um, changes in habits. Like we know our kids, when they start doing things different, if they are a, a kid that sleeps 10 hours and all of a sudden they start sleeping um, 12 and 14 hours then, you know, there's it, it, something we need to be paying attention to. Or if they go the other direction and they were sleeping uh, seven, eight hours and now they're sleeping three or four. If you find them being up at night, you hear activity in their room. Um, but then when you ask them what they're doing, they say nothing. You start seeing doors being locked that weren't locked. And I know some of you are like, you don't lock doors in my house. Um, but I understand that when we go to sleep, our kids uh, definitely can still be up doing things. If you're finding them sneaking to get on iPads or iPhones. I know some of you take the devices and put them in your room, um, but you're noticing that that cord was moved or something wasn't exactly in the place that you put it, uh, then you may have someone that's kind of sneaking in and using things while you're asleep. Uh, so those are some changes to know, uh, notice. Withdrawing from their friends, if they're a very active, outgoing, social person, and then all of a sudden that changes and they don't want to do anything with anybody anymore. They're spending a lot of time in their room. They don't even really want to be around family very much. Um, that's an indication. For our younger kids, it may end up being things like stomach aches um, or headaches, or they'll just say they're hurting. They can't really explain why they don't feel good, um, but they can't really definitively tell you what on them um, is, is bothering them. Uh, and that's constant. They're not wanting to go to school. Um, or uh, you're getting calls frequently from school to come get them because they're not feeling good. 
if you see them not being even outgoing in their classroom, a lot of times our kids have relationships with their teachers and their classmates. If your teachers are saying, hey, I've noticed they're just not as you know bubbly, as happy, or as talkative as they used to be. They used to check in with me every morning, get a smile, and now they just kind of go quietly to their desk and they don't talk much to, to anybody else in the class. That would be an indicator. Um, then it's just loss of interest in anything they used to do if they're they enjoyed sports or, or puzzles, reading, dancing, writing, drawing, then all of a sudden they stop those things. And, and not in the stop that I've kind of outgrown it. So I'm going from um, being a younger kid to a teenager. And so I'm, I'm not playing with my Pokemon cards anymore. But things that you know they were passionate about that uh, they had goals in or projects they were working on. And then all of a sudden they just put it down. Um, Frequent questions about death or conversations about uh, death and dying, um, uh, how, how, if, if death hurts, um, if you see internet searches, because I know you all are looking at your kids' browsers, I definitely encourage you to be if you're not um, checking out what they're looking at and you're seeing death and dying kind of information, that's a, that's a flag. Um, frequent statements of just like kind of this feelings of, of powerlessness or helplessness, like nobody will be able to help with me with that. No one understands. Life is too hard. Um, I can't live without. That's a that's a big one. Um, so especially after a breakup um, or a loss in the family, I can't live without said person. That's definitely a, a warning sign that we need to kind of follow up on. Um, I, I, I think that anytime uh, you're asking if, if there's anything you can do to help or what's going on and I know you wouldn't understand, no, you don't, right? Those are, those are usually indications that we probably need to ask a few more questions. You see your kids giving away possessions, things that they really value. I know all of our kids have things that they are just, um, you better not touch it. Might be their shoes, might be their electronics, might be um, something that they made or won or something, but, but they really are very protective over it. If all of a sudden they're giving that to people, uh, when you couldn't even touch it before, then that, that could be an indication. Uh, writings or drawings about death. Um, sometimes you'll see kids do poetry or blogs. Um, you'll see kids uh, draw pictures and you'll see death in there a lot. Um, a lot of darkness in it. Um, that's an indication, those mood changes where, and I know you're like, all our kids are moody. Well, they are, but we know they're moody. But if you go from being a pretty even keeled kid to now you're aggressive, you're punching walls, you're throwing stuff, you're angry all the time. Um, you're doing a lot of crying or, or, uh, you're just, again, withdrawing from people. And that's a huge change as opposed to like, okay, now you guys, I don't think you're cool anymore. I want to hang out with my friends, but I'm just literally spending all my time in my room. It's just something to check into. Uh, so what can we do? Well, as parents, first of all, again, we don't want to put our kids in a position where we're saying to them, oh my goodness, are you suicidal? I just watched a video. Uh, excuse me. You've like, I check off half of these things for you. Clearly, you must be suicidal, right? So let's not put uh, things onto our children. But but let's ask some questions. Let's ask some follow-up questions. Like, we want to be honest. Like, hey, I've noticed some changes in your behavior. There are things that uh, you used to do and you used to enjoy, and you're not doing them as much anymore. I've heard from your teacher that you're kind of withdrawn in class. That's not like you. You're usually excited about going to school and seeing your friends. Um, so like what's going on, right? So open-ended questions. They don't necessarily be closed questions of, are you depressed, are you, right? So just asking them like, what's going on? What's different? What's changed? Oh, nothing, nothing's different. Well, something's gotta be a little bit different. Um, you know how, and you can just ask questions about, hey, are you having any problems sleeping? Are you tired more? Are you, right? So kind of general basic questions and then did anything change with any of your friends? Did anything change at school? Did you, um, um, anything different at this time? Um, and, and just allowing them to talk and, and be okay with pauses. Be okay with, with kids being a, um, a little hesitant and a little uncomfortable. They might talk around stuff and tell stories. And I know you all get frustrated when your kids tell those long stories and you're like, what is the point? But this is a time when you really just need to listen because sometimes that is how they are trying to share information with us and process is through those stories. Um, so being, being a good listener, not trying to jump in, not and not being dismissive. I think a lot of times we'll say things like, well, that's not a big deal. I know that especially when we are concerned about their academics, we're like, well, what you need them friends for? It don't matter. They're not good for you anyway. You need to focus on your books, 
right? But that's not how my, my child feel, feels. To my child, these relationships are very important. And so if they are important to my child, then I need to act as if they're important, even if they're not things that I necessarily think should be important to them. So like, okay, well, tell me what happened with your friend group. Um, let's talk about it. And so they get that safe space to be able to share without feeling judged um, or without feeling like you think what they're going through is trivial. That'll allow them to be more open with you um, and not feel like, again, that you wouldn't understand. Don't make promises you can't keep. So if, if they say, well, I'm going to tell you something, but you can't tell anybody or I don't want to talk about it again or right. That's not well, it depends on what it is. Um, so I'm not going to make you that promise, but I will tell you that I will listen openly and, and do my best to be as supportive of you as I can. Um, be compassionate, right? Just sometimes we just need people to sit with us in a space of hurt. Uh, and, and we don't have to hurry through that space. Uh, we don't have to feel like we have to fix it. Just simply being there sometimes, there is just power in our presence. Um, don't make it about you. So when your kids start talking about everything you're going through and you like this, is nothingness. Um, you don't say that. And you also don't tell them, well, look, you think you got problems. Let me tell you what I'm dealing with every day, right? <laughs> so let's not launch into uh, my struggle is worse than your struggle. Uh, nobody wins that game. Instead, let me just hear them and be able to sit in that in that space with them. Um, and, and again, just kind of guiding questions, but open so they can do more of the talking. It is absolutely okay for you to not know the answer to something or not know how to handle something. And you say, hey, thank you so much for sharing. Um, let me process, let me kind of figure out the best ways to support you and we'll talk about it again tomorrow or we'll talk about it in a couple of days, I'll check in with you. And then you go get some information. Don't try to speak on things you're not sure about uh, because we don't want to give children false hopes about things and then they find out like later, okay, that wasn't accurate at all. So am I going to really trust my parent then? It's okay for you to take that break and that models for them. Sometimes we need to process and then come back later and we might do the problem solving. There are a couple of resources out there that I would definitely recommend for you all. I know everybody has seen the National Suicide Prevention Hotline information, 1-800-273-8255. Um, there's also, I, I like for people to, uh, if you're, right, so you ask these questions and you realize my child may not be suicidal, but maybe they're depressed and that depression could lead to suicide or they're going through some adjustments and they need to talk to somebody or they are suicidal. They are directly suicidal. We know that we need to get them to more immediate care. But if they are um, just really, really struggling and starting to get to that downward spiral, then that's a good opportunity for them to see a therapist. And so great way to find therapists. Um, you can go through your insurance, uh, of course, contact them or get on the website and get a list of resources that are available to you in terms of um, location and gender and some of the other things you want. Psychology Today, you absolutely can go on there as well and pick, I think that resource, um, so you just Google Psychology Today, that resource allows you to be more um, kind of careful in how you pick a provider for your kid and so you may know they need a female that's at a certain age group that may have a Christian background. Um, and so you can put in those those criteria. And now because we're able to do um, the telehealth so easily, even if they're not in your city, they're somewhere else in the state, you bridge that gap because your child can see them uh, on the screen and not have to worry about trying to get two hours away because I know some of us are in areas where there's not a lot of options for therapists of different um, backgrounds and so that kind of helps you not be so limited. Uh, you definitely can also, um, there are some websites that have specific things like there's a uh, therapy for black girls so you want a black female therapist you can go there, therapy for black men black male therapist, you can go there. So there are def different groups, Christian counselor. So there's a lot of those terms that you can put in to be able to access those kind of things as well. Um, and, and we wanna make sure when we're talking to our kids that we have a language that they can understand. We're not talking above their heads. Like you don't need to tell your five-year-old they need, they're, they're getting an appointment with psychologists. They're gonna be like, what are you talking about, right? So, you know, you may be able to say, hey, we're gonna find, um, get some support so that we're not so scared 
um, or so we're not so sad, um, or so our tummy doesn't hurt so bad, right? So we're like, so we can talk to them where they can understand it. Our teenagers, we can talk to them a little bit uh, more directly, but do understand that uh, not all the time is your teen gonna be like, woohoo, I'm ready to go to therapy. Sometimes they're gonna be like, I'm gonna get in there and I'm not gonna say anything, and that's fine. You take them there and you let, that's why we have child and adolescent psychologists so they can, uh, and, and mental health therapists so they can get with someone who knows how to be able to connect with them to get them to talk. So don't worry about them not being excited about going. Um, it, it's just a good opportunity for you to be able to get additional support as well as to put them in a space where if there are some challenges they don't feel comfortable talking to you about they have other people they can. I'm also a, a big proponent of identifying other safe adults that your children can talk to, right? We don't want them going to peers and other people that are gonna give them um, all kinds of misinformation, like identify, hey, if you don't feel comfortable talking to me, you can talk to um, your aunt, you can talk to your uncle, you can talk to grandpa, you can write, you can talk. So they have people that they know are safe folks. Um, that they can be able to go to so they don't feel like they're so alone, okay? So I know this is a lot of information and I know you might be feeling a little bit overwhelmed right now. Uh, so take a breath and recognize that just because your child may be in a space right now where they're struggling doesn't necessarily they're going to mean they're gonna end up on um, the side of, of completing suicide. We just wanna be preventative, make sure that they have resources um, check in with them early on when we see things and not wait until things have escalated to a point where it's now we're trying to um, deal with more crisis than we are being able to get in the prevention uh, and intervention mode. Okay, you got this. You can handle this. And, and your kids need you. They appreciate you. They love you even if they don't tell you all the time. Um, but sometimes, just like us, they need a little bit more support. Okay, be encouraged.